Hello, Dr. Robert Spitzer, renowned psychiatrist. My name is Megan Badix. Most folks call me Mo. I'm giving you an apology. This is the third one of these that I have written. Back in February, I was asked to give a performative response to the Occupy movement, and I chose to apologize to Alan Greenspan. It was an attempt on my part to cut through the political anger into something more humanistic. I got positive input on the apology from my peers and advisors. So when the NATO conference came into town, it felt appropriate and important to apologize to General John Allen, who had himself apologized for soldiers who had burned Korans under his watch. Again, I looked for human connections beyond political status, stature, or public presence, and again, found the experience to be deeply humanizing. I've actually been wanting to apologize to you for months. You issued an apology back in April. It's now past Thanksgiving weekend. Here's the beginning part of your apology, as leaked to several special interest blogs. It's a letter to Dr. Ken Zucker, ed editor of Archives of Sexual Behavior, in which your paper was originally published. I quote, Several months ago, I told you that because of my revised view of my 2001 study of reparative therapy changing sexual orientation, I was considering writing something that would acknowledge that I now judge the major critiques of the study as largely correct. After discussing my revised view of the study with Gabriel Arana, a reporter for American Prospect, and with Malcolm Ritter, an Associated Press science writer, I decided that I had to make public my current thinking about the study. Here it is. Gabriel Arana had gone through therapeutic attempts to change his sexuality, to de-gay unsuccessfully, and with traumatic results. You are primarily credited with the removal of homosexuality from the American Psychiatric Association's 1973 Revised Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. You made homosexuality not a mental illness. Then, in 2001, you gave credibility to, quote, ex-gay therapeutic practices that is, the attempt through therapy to change a person's sexuality, largely from queer to straight, by conducting a study of clients of said therapeutic practices. You published a paper called, Can Some Gay Men and Lesbians Change Their Sexual Orientation? You told the New York Times, People at the time did say to me, Bob, you're messing with your career, don't do it. But I just didn't feel vulnerable. The Mayo Clinic asks, what are the effects of holding a grudge? If you're unforgiving, you might pay the price repeatedly by bringing anger and bitterness into every relationship and new experience. Your life might become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't enjoy the present. You might become depressed or anxious. You might feel that your life lacks meaning or purpose or that you're at odds with your spiritual beliefs. You might lose valuable and enriching connectedness with others. Your letter to Zucker continues. Basic research question. From the beginning it was, can some version of re reparative therapy enable individuals to change their sexual orientation from homosexual to heterosexual? Realizing that the study design made it impossible to answer this question, I suggested that the study could be viewed as answering the question, how do individuals undergoing reparative therapy describe changes in sexual orientation? A not very interesting question. Aside from apologies, I've also been obsessed with bioremediation, our chemical and physical ability to clean up after ecological disasters and mess ups. An executive can apologize for the decimation caused by an oil spill, but the use of surfactants and chemicals in cleanup will leave a long and lingering effect. No amount of apologizing makes up for that, only literally ecologically restorative efforts. BP has since gone to great lengths to acknowledge the damage done by its recent oil spill and highlight its inadequate restoration efforts to propagandistic levels. Back to your letter. The fatal flaw in the study. There was no way to judge the credibility of subject reports of change in sexual orientation. I offered several unconvincing reasons why it was reasonable to assume that the subject's reports of change were credible and not self-deception or outright lying, but the simple fact is that there was no way to determine if the subject's accounts of change were valid. I had one or two people question the sincerity of my apologies to Alan Greenspan and General John Allen. 
I think it would be dishonest not to acknowledge that they were written with some idea of the context of art school and an art school audience. But fundamentally, I tried to address them as I'm trying to address you now, as if I were speaking directly to the person. This is an issue with all public apologies. It's difficult to determine the apologizer's sincerity or whether the apology is being made for publicity or politics sake. It's impossible to determine whether apologizers are singularly motivated by such things or whether we all aren't all just a mix of intentions. I prefer to give the benefit of the doubt and assume the apologizer is sincere, but the real test is actions following, learning and moving forward. Your letter again. I believe I owe the gay community an apology for my study making unproven claims of the efficacy of reparative therapy. I also apologize to any gay person who wasted time and energy undergoing some form of reparative therapy because they believed that I had proven that reparative therapy works with some quote-unquote highly motivated individuals. Robert Spitzer, MD, Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry, Columbia University. There's a pattern in my apologies at this point. They're all apologies to white men of some political or cultural stature who have apologized themselves for grave errors that have resulted in deep distress in people's lives. I can think of a few apologies in my life that I've received and have deeply appreciated. I've been in therapy this past year myself. But on a cultural level, I deeply appreciate someone with significant success and clout owning up to a professional mistake, despite whatever personal stress it may cause them, in order to benefit the greater good. You apologized for a lack of thoroughness in your own research, acknowledging your own flawed thinking and its repercussions at a time when there was no apparent politi political benefit for doing so. There's definitely been times in the past when I could have given a professional apology myself and didn't. That you made the effort when you were 80 and retired speaks to your conscience and humanity. And I'm sorry for not always living up to that standard. Right now I'm trying to make a cultural connection between the bioremediative abilities of bacteria and the acts of apologies and forgiveness. I like owning up to mistakes, acknowledging them and moving forward to become a transhuman act. In doing so, I am continually discovering flaws in my own thinking. Thank you so much for your apology. My name is Mo. I'm sorry. <laughs>